What's going on everybody? Welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. We finally got us a Chop episode. It's been a minute and this episode comes to us by way of a collaboration with Brian Huntley of Short Circuited Brewers. If you don't know Brian, his Short Circuited Brewers YouTube channel is all about electric systems. On top of brewing, he's a tech nerd, so he does a lot of equipment reviews, puts things together, takes them apart, sees how they work, and he does a lot of live stream brewing, which we here at Chop and Brew don't necessarily do. So check out his YouTube channel. Now, as you can see here, this pork has a nice marbly fat through it, and that's actually what we want. In this episode, Brian is not in the brew house, he's in the kitchen. And he's going to show us the process for making homemade sausage using pork shoulder and some of his favorite spices. Before I pass the baton to Brian, I want to let you know of a couple episodes I'm editing right now and will be coming up next on Chop and Brew. This weekend I've been shooting footage with a beekeeper named Dean Anderson here in St. Paul and uh, I bought honey from him a couple years ago and made mead with it and he invited me to come watch him during his extraction process. It's the end of the season. He's extracting honey from all of his hives and getting ready to sell his delicious Como Lake honey. So I throw on a bee suit and ride shotgun with him on that. And then something that's gonna blow your mind. I found this footage from 2014's Homebrew Con. After thinking that this card was lost forever, I came across it and it is hilarious. It's basically just some footage from the Brewing Network anniversary party, which was held on a baseball field, kickball, all kinds of like carnival games. We want beer! We want beer! We want beer! We want beer! I think they want beer, Chip. And then Ted, our boy Ted Weidman, man, he runs club night. We let him loose with a mic. He absolutely had a ball. Watching this footage has just really made me like appreciate how awesome it was to be able to be in giant rooms with thousands of homebrewers and just the camaraderie and the joking and the good time. So that's coming up. Hopefully that'll be a little comic relief here in the 2020. As always, if you'd like to show your support for Chop and Brew and keep the show strong and doing fun stuff like this, head over to patreon.com slash chop and brew. Now we're off to the short-circuited kitchen with Brian to see how the sausage is made. <laughs> ah, I'm drinking too much coffee, man! I really like sausage, and to be more specific, I like spicy sausage. Not too hot, so it's like really, really hot, but just a little bit of spice to kick it up a notch. Now, I have got a about an eight and a half pound pork shoulder here, and I find that shoulder works really, really well to make sausage with. It's got about the right fat content to it. Now, the one thing about the shoulder that I've got, it does have the blade bone in it, so I'm going to have to deal with that and remove it, but... I'll show you how I break it down and what I do to get it ready to actually grind it and make sausage with it. So I'll start usually on the end without the bone and I'll just start cutting off chunks of it. And one thing that you see sometimes in videos with uh, people making sausage or even grinding meat or whatever, they cut it into cubes. But I find that cutting it into strips like this actually works really, really well it'll feed right down into my grinder and I can almost use these like the uh, whatever the I can't remember what the name of that stupid thing is the it looks like a muddler <laughs> the the push stick uh, I find that it works almost without having to use that now as you can see here this pork has a nice marbly fat through it and that's actually what we want for making the sausage that is actually going to be a perfect amount of fat in there. If you get one that has a really, really thick cap, uh, fat cap on it, meaning that it has a bunch of fat on top, that is kind of a prized possession, to be honest with you. I've actually gotten a couple of them that had such a thick fat cap on it that I cut off some of the fat cap and actually put it aside. So just in case I didn't get enough fat cap on one. So I'm going to cut this into chunks here. And what I'd like to do is I like to lay it out on a half sheet pan. That half sheet pan actually fits perfectly into my fridge. I've got a pull out tray in the fridge or freezer, the lower freezer, and it fits perfectly in there. It sits right inside of it. And I put it in there for about an hour and then come back and make the sausage. So 
I'll just show you real quick here, getting around the bone. When you come to the bone, and you can kind of see it here in the end, I like to use a fillet knife for this because of the fact that it's just so much easier to get around it. I'm going to cut off a little bit more of this side here. Uh, I'm running into the bone there, so let me slide over here and cut this off. And I'll show you how I go around the bone. Cut this into some chunks real quick. And inevitably with this size of a, a shoulder, you're going to fill up this sheet pan. And I don't have any issues. I'll usually just like lay them sideways on there and they'll still get plenty of exposure to the to the uh, freezing temperatures. Now what I usually would do, I'll start at this end over here and the blade bone has kind of a little dish in it. So I'll follow that dish and then come back and just uh, run the knife both ways and get that meat out of there. And then once you get to the top of it, then you can kind of run your knife and find where the top of it's at and uh, just start to cut around that bone. And you might leave a little bit behind, which is not a huge ordeal. These bones actually make a really good base for a soup stock. You can boil these with some vegetables and make some really nice pork stock. So then same way with the lower end down here. I'm going to find the edge of the bone and just carve around it. And you can see there, got a lot of the bone exposed. Come back and just kind of shave off the bone there. And then just keep cutting it, keep working at it. Follow the bone with your knife. And there's one area that's kind of really sharply curved. And you can feel it with your knife whenever you're in there. And then get that out. If you can find a boneless pork shoulder for not a premium, I'd say get that. But uh, if not, you can just do a little deboning like I'm doing here. And all right, there it is. And we didn't lose too much meat at all. So we'll get back to this and uh, flip it back over, do some more slices on it. And uh, I just kind of flip it back over without the bone in it and then make my cuts accordingly. That's a nice piece of fat cap right there for sure. That'll make, uh, that'll make some good fat content. And then just a little pieces, just throw those in there. We'll use those as well. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and get this finished cutting up. Uh, finish cutting this up and then I'm going to throw it in the freezer. And then we'll let it go for about an hour is usually what I find. And the fat is definitely going to be more solid quicker than the meat. So I like to usually let it go until I, I find that the fat is pretty firm and the meat will be somewhat firm at that point, but it might not be totally frozen. And you don't really want it totally frozen to do this, but it certainly helps run it through the grinder and come out with a good texture. And not only that, but it also prevents the friction from the grinder from actually melting some of the fat and you don't want that. So I'm going to go ahead and get this finished up and uh, put it in the freezer and uh, we'll be back in an hour. All right, it's been a little bit over an hour. I let it go for a little bit longer. I reached into the freezer and tested it out to see how it felt and it was actually still a little bit flexible. Um, it's not completely frozen and you don't want it that way. Um, it's, it's got a good amount of stiffness to it so it's gonna help it run through the grinder. One thing about the grinder, I didn't spend a ton of money on it. I, I don't do sausage and everything all the time. I actually bought it off eBay several years ago. I think it was probably like 60 or 70 bucks. Not bad, it's like a 500 watt unit. Um, I, it works fine for me, it does go a little bit slow. But like I said, I don't make stuff all the time. If I made it all the time, I might invest in a little bit larger one. It is a bit noisy, just to warn you. So when I crank it on, you're gonna, <laughs> it's gonna be a little bit noisy. But I'll just show you real quick uh, how it works and how the, the meat cut in strips works. It actually works really well. So let's uh, crank this thing on and we'll give it a whirl.
So as you can see, I mean, it works really, really well. The strips actually don't require you to have to use this thing at all, at least in my experience. I mean, sometimes when I get to the end and I've got little bits and pieces, I'll have to do that. But for the most part, I can just stick the pieces in there and they run right through. So I'm going to go ahead and finish grinding all this up. And then when I come back, we'll talk about the spices and see how we did. All right, so we got all of our sausage ground. Now I wanna talk a little bit about seasoning and that's kind of where sausage takes on its character in my opinion. And I have gone through a bunch of different recipes over the last year in trying to make good sausage. And I took a little bit from here, a little bit from there and tweaked it and adjusted it to my own liking. And I think I've come up with a recipe that is really, really good. So what I've got for the recipe, the amounts that I'm showing on the screen will be per pound of sausage for the seasoning. So we've got salt, we've got a good amount of cayenne pepper, and then one of the quintessential flavors in sausage, in my opinion, is sage. We've got plenty of that. Black pepper, red pepper flakes, and then the unlikely ingredient is coriander. And I think it just adds a little bit of brightness, a little bit of punch to the flavor that actually brightens the whole sausage up and makes it just taste absolutely delicious. So I'm gonna grab the sausage out of the fridge here. I threw it in the fridge real quick after I got done grinding it while I measured out all my spices. And what we're gonna do is we'll go ahead and throw all this spice mixture into our sausage, our ground pork. And what you wanna do is just kinda mix this all up without making too much of a mess. Probably had, should have had a bigger bowl, but this is the biggest one that I've got. This is the biggest batch of sausage that I've made so far because I keep going through it so fast. I thought I'll just make all of it into sausage. And you can take this ground pork base and make pork patties and all kinds of stuff like that. I actually made a bunch of different kind of pork patties recently. Uh, did Italian seasoning, Greek seasoning, uh, did blue cheese in the middle with blackened seasoning on the inside of the burger and then on the outside. And I'm telling you what, pork burgers actually, I'm, I'm almost rivaling beef burgers to be honest with you because they, they come out really moist and delicious. You don't want to overwork this too much because of the fact you're going to start putting a lot of heat into it from your hands and that'll start to melt the fat, which we don't want. Now, this is pretty coarse ground. I used a six millimeter, I think it was six or four. Yeah, six millimeter with quarter inch die in my grinder. So this is pretty coarse, but what we need to do now is we actually need to do uh, form what is called the primary bind. And that's kind of basically what gives sausage its texture. It is the way that the, it, it kind of glues it together almost, if you will. I know that sounds a little weird, but you'll see what I'm talking about here in just a second. So in order to do that, what I like to use is my KitchenAid with the paddle attachment on it. And what I'll do is basically I'll just put probably, I don't know, about half the sausage in there. And then what I'll do is I'll put the paddle attachment on and we'll stick it down in the meat, lock it down, and then basically I'll just start letting it work and turn it up a little bit after it gets going. And then what's gonna happen is it kind of starts to smash all of that pork together and create long strands almost, if you will. And you can kind of see when it starts to do it in the bowl, you'll start to see a little bit of uh, coating on the bowl around the sides. And basically what's gonna happen is, with this primary bind, when you grab a chunk of sausage, basically it should hold together. And this needs to go for just a little bit longer, but uh, we'll run it a little bit longer. And this also helps mix the seasoning together too, which is nice. So I'm gonna let this go a little bit longer and do the primary bind on that. And that actually looks pretty good. It's starting to kind of bind up a little bit. <laughs> Primary bind, right? So now we've got the sausage and it actually looks like it's gonna hold together pretty well. So if I grab a chunk of the sausage out of there, 
I can hold it like this. If I grab a chunk of this, it's like it just falls apart. But I've got that stuff is all sticking together. So that is what we want. This is my kitchen aid, by the way. <laughs> if you use your wife's, make sure you get, uh, or significant other, make sure you get their permission before you start whacking away with sausage on it. They might freak out just a little bit. So got a good bind on that. That looks really good. Now, one of the things that I highly suggest that you do before we start the packaging process is you want to make a small patty and fry it up and taste it to make sure that the, that the seasoning is exactly what you intended or what you wanted. If you want it a little bit less hot, you can either cut that cayenne and red pepper ingredient in, in half or just leave it out altogether. I mean, you'll still have fine sausage, so not a big deal at all. Now, I am very confident in my recipe, so I'm not even worried about making a patty, but I highly suggest that if you do this recipe for the first time, make a patty, fry it up, make sure that the seasoning is to your liking. If you need a little more salt, add a little more salt, etc. So, all right, so I've got this done. Let me get this kind of cleaned up a little bit, and I will show you how I package the sausage so that I can have one pound increments anytime that I want. All right, now for packaging, what I like to do is I'll take some cling wrap and pull off about a square, same length as width, and I'll lay out a bunch of them on the side of the counter. And then what I'll do from there is I'll zero out my scale, and then I will pull out what I think to be about a pound, measure that out. You can be as precise as you want or not. Uh, so do that, and then I'll grab one of these sheets of cellophane, or saran wrap, whatever you want to call it, and kind of smash this together, and then place it in the middle of the saran wrap at the back, and then I will kind of roll this up like your burrito, if you will, kind of try to force any air out that you possibly can. Roll it all the way to the end, and then what I'll do is I'll grab both ends of the cellophane and actually roll this thing on the counter, roll it up like that, and then basically I've got a one pound chub of sausage. And then I'll just keep repeating that until I've got all of the sausage packaged up. And then those things can actually go in the freezer just fine. If you want like a little extra layer of protection, if you think you're not going to eat it for a while, I would say you can wrap them up with a little bit of aluminum foil and it'll be just fine. But I find that this, I've had them, had sausage chubs in the freezer for a month or even a month and a half. And I've had zero problems with, with packaging in this way. The thing that causes freezer burn a lot of times is oxygen exposure, which is kind of why I talked about making sure you get all the air out of there. And so as long as there's not a lot of air in between the cellophane and the pork, then generally you don't have any issues with any kind of freezer burn. I have not had any since I have been doing this. So, And then, you know, you got a recipe that calls for one pound of sausage. You got your sausage there and you are ready to go. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little collaboration, bringing some chop back to the brew that Chip has been doing recently. I really enjoyed doing the collaboration with him. Uh, I've been a big fan of chips ever since the uh, Northern Brewer days. Be sure to go over and check out my channel if you don't mind. I do a lot of tips and techniques as well as live brew days and product reviews. And uh, you can find me on the Instagram and the Facebook and all those thingies right here. So check that out. And without further ado, chop for chop, brew for brew. We'll see you on the next one. Now it's time to see how the sausage is made. <laughs> Fuck, dude. It sounds so goofy, man. It's sausage time. It's sausage time. It's sausage time in Brian's house. It's sausage time. It's sausage time. It's sausage time at Brian Huntley's house. I don't think I ever said his last name in the intro. Son of a bitch. Now we're off to the short-circuited kitchen to see how the sausage is made. <laughs>
Dude, there's no way I didn't say his first, his last name. I got this. I need to be about two inches taller so I can get this shirt into frame all the way without being like, Pinnail! Bow! Brian makes this look so much easier. <laughs> He's got great equipment and room I don't have either at the moment. Brian Huntley. Chris Traeger. Ann Perkins. Leslie Nope. And now we're off to the short-circuited kitchen to see how the... Uh, point that way. Point that way. <laughs> As always, if you want to help the show and support Chop and Brew, keep it strong, head over to patreon.com slash chop and brew and let us know you're with us. <laughs> you against us, man? Often people say it's not good to see how the sausage is being made, but in this case, <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say here.